Sorry. Okay, we'll start by going over um, some of the frontiers of our policy RL, like what is interesting, open, what do people do research on? Um, and then we will um, try to go to model-based RL and see if we can work out how to do model-based RL better, right? Okay, so to start, um, you know, our policy RL, it's, it's promising. It seems to work a lot better than policy gradient because it's so much more sample efficient. But it's not so plug and play, right? Like normally, if you take a problem, you throw PPO at it, it'll it'll work eventually. Uh, it's just that it'll take you five days to train it. Whereas off policy RL, when it works, will take three hours. But you don't know if, when it'll work, when it won't won't work. Um, it's often not clear what parameters to tune, right? So it's like much more of a art to get off policy RL to work as compared to policy gradient, where you just peep, the default parameters for PPO just like work on everything. Um, mostly, right? So it's often unstable. And um, when you go to high dimensional observations, this gets even more public. Right? So uh, a lot of like deep RL research and just even robotic learning research right now is on how to make these off policy RL methods more stable, more, more understandable, more scalable. Right? And so here are some directions that I think are interesting. Right? The first is, I think, we talked about experience replay, put things in a replay buffer, sample from them. Um, but often, how you sample from the replay buffer makes a big difference. And so um, sampling methods, there's theory, right? Like, how do you reconcile um, Q-learning and approximate dynamic programming have a bunch of theoretical results, but the practice often differs. How do you reconcile them? How do you get better theoretical results? Um, Things like exploration, uh, when you want to use RL in practice, exploration becomes a big bottleneck. How do you get off policy RL method to explore? Um, trying to get them to work with high dimensional, you know, observations like images, especially complex, noisy ones, um, is difficult still. And lastly, we said we're going to avoid non-Markovianness, but you can only do that for so long. So, um, how do you deal with partial observability and non-Markovian environment? I think all of these are like open research directions. If anyone wants to look at projects in them, that would be interesting. Let's let's go over them one by one, and I'll I'll give you a little flavor. Um, my slides will have um, references to papers you should read. If you're interested in any one of the areas, just go through the papers there, and they'll give you a flavor. Okay, so the first um, frontier that I think is interesting is prioritizing experience, right? So what I mean is, let's say um, let's say we have this tree structure. MDT, right? Um, and what you can show empirically is that when you try to do updates in this tree structured MDP with um, off policy methods, the order in which you do the updates really, really matters, right? And the idea is that um, what works really well is when you do the updates from the bottom to the top, right? So you kind of fix the things on the bottom, then you do the next level, then you do the next level. Right. Whereas if you just choose randomly from different nodes in the tree, a lot of the updates are wasted. They're bad. You get like this really, really unstable behavior shown here on the right. Right. So the choice of how you prioritize which um, transitions to do updates on makes a big difference in practice. Right. So people have looked at lots of different methods, like prioritizing transitions by how big is the Bellman error, the TD error, right? or by using some measure of uncertainty to pick the most uncertain transition or to have some measure of you know, how good or bad is the, the Q function and then do things on, on where the Q function is, um, is bad or, or good. And so there's a bunch of open research areas and how do you properly prioritize um, sampling from the replay buffer? And they make a big difference in practice. So um, I would look at some of these methods as interesting to explore. Um, okay, the, the second thing that's interesting um, is trying to understand theoretical properties, right? So like when um, things are tabular, Q-learning converges, the proof is readable um, and, and, and makes sense. But when you go to function approximations, even if it's linear function approximation, um, if you have time at the end of the lecture, I'll prove how linear function approximation diverges. But you can show that often, unless you're careful, these methods will diverge arbitrarily, especially when you're off policy, when you use bootstrapping with function approximation. And this gets worse if you go from linear to bilinear or quadratic or polynomial. 
uh, these these things get worse. Um, and then when you go to big neural nets, you see lots of like empirical phenomena, which kind of we don't have good theory explanations for. And so for those of you who are theoretically inclined, trying to understand the convergence properties of um, the parallel methods, even under you know somewhat simple um, parameterization of your Q function or policy is very much un unclear. Okay. All right. Uh, the next thing is exploration, right? So exploration is you drop your robot into an environment or your you know agent into an environment. It needs to find reward, but the reward is you only get reward when you like mine the diamonds. And the diamonds are there, there. You never get them. Right? And so often you need to explore the world effectively to even find the reward. And then you need to once you find it, you need to balance off. Um, you know, exploring the world with exploiting what you found, right? And so there's this this question of how do you firstly explore the world effectively, especially when you're you know in high dimensional spaces. And secondly, once you've explored, how do you how do you balance that off with exploitation, right? And so there's a lot of research in exploration. Right? So things that do uncertainty based methods, right? Like things like bootstrap ensembles, things that do count based methods. So trying to estimate counts or densities in high dimensional spaces, um, things that try to estimate information gain. So how much does a particular transition give you information about the environment, right? And so all of these are different ways to approach the exploration problem. Um, the ones that work best in practice are super hacky. And so I think it's useful to develop um, principled methods that work really well in practice. And and we aren't there yet. So um, it's super critical. Like in all your projects, you'll find that you usually will have to throw some exploration bonus set things to get it to work. And so it often matters a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next thing is image-based off policy RL. So if you know have things from low dimensional states, let's say you like knew all the joints of your robot arm, right? Needed Q learning, it would probably do something reasonable. But often when you go to really high dimensional things like images, right? Um, so I don't have any pictures here. But when you go to high dimensional images, um, everything gets unstable. Sometimes it doesn't learn. Um, sometimes it'll learn and unlearn or take so long that it defeats the point, right? And so a lot of the research right now, especially to get robots to work is you have to get them to work from camera images or point clouds and things like that. Um, and how do we get that to work in a stable and efficient way? Right? So people try data augmentation, they try pre training representations with some, you know, vision based algorithms, contrastive learning, masked autoencoder, whatever. Right? Um, and then they also try doing things where they use student teacher architecture. So they train something with low dimensional states, and then they use that to supervise something that goes from high dimensional observations. Right? So they train something from, you know, known joint positions in a simulator. They use that to supervise something that works from camera images, and then you deploy that in your in your system. Right? But um, I think there's for those of you who've tried this before, it like works on the reported environment, but you try it on a new environment, and it like has a fifty percent chance of not working. And so um, I think there's a lot of open research to be done here. And uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, lastly, partial observability. So we talked about the Bellman equation last time, right? The Bellman equation really depends on this like decomposition of your Q function to do dynamic programming. Um, the decomposition really depends on the Markovian properties. You have to, um, you know, say your future is independent of your past given your present. Um, but uh, in like maze navigation, for instance, right? The future is not independent of the past given the present, right? It's egocentric vision. You don't know exactly where you are. You know the state of the world, and so we have to think of these history condition methods or how to maintain a belief over what the world's you know true state is. And so it's difficult to do um, these off policy methods with partial observability. Um, some people have started trying things, but it doesn't work perfectly. Yeah. In practice, can you model partial observability? Yeah, but it's not just stochasticity because it's like control. It's like normally stochasticity is. Just like random, right? Yeah. Whereas here it's more like if you looked at your history, it wouldn't be stochastic. <laughs> or or there would be a distribution, but it wouldn't be just like arbitrarily stochastic. And so I think just pretending that part partial observability will manifest as stochasticity, but it's not like undirected stochasticity. Right? And so I think it's a little more involved than just saying pretend. But yeah, sorry, next slide. 
Cool. All right. So, yeah. So those are some open research problems. Um, if anyone wants to talk about them, uh, I'm happy to discuss things after class or in office hours. But yeah, all of these are super exciting research areas. So you, you should look into them. Okay, and then let's look at some videos. Um, how well does off policy RL work for robotics? Right. So this is a video I like from from the folks at Berkeley where they have this um, unitary dog which they deploy um, in the Berkeley Hills, right? And they just train it with model free off policy reinforcement learning um, directly in the real world, no simulator, right? And they they um, show that you can learn in around twenty minutes of training time. Um, directly in the real world in different terrains. So they drop it in, you know, this muddy path in the fire trails. They take it to some grass, they take it in concrete, et cetera. And you just retrain in 20 minutes and um, it seems to work pretty well, right? Um, which is, I think, pretty exciting. Um, it doesn't like, it's not an awesome walker, but I think you could make it better with uh, with some changes. But the only real changes you made to off policy RL to get this to work um, was increase the number of ensembles. We talked about these like ensemble methods to deal with overestimation. You go from you know two ensemble members to 20 ensemble members. Um, and then you make some changes to the hyperparameters and change the number of steps you do, number of gradient steps you do. And it you know lets you go from like several hours of training time to just 20 minutes of training time. So that's that's pretty neat. Um, this is another video from from some students working with me. Um, on trying to do dexterous manipulation uh, with these kinds of off-policy methods. And so here we're going from purely visual observations and we're trying to get this hand to do things like brushing the plate or like hooking things in, um, trying to insert pipe into this faucet thingy. Um, and it's doing this with um, purely real world experience and it's uh, trying to do things without any reset. So we just leave the robot running for you know, 30 hours you come back and it learns how to do a lot of these tasks just through experience, um, which is also pretty neat. Um, here's some other work from DeepMind at her school on trying to do stacking. Right? So stacking is difficult because you have to reason about the physics of the world. There's different shapes that form a somewhat <laughs> unstable system, right? And so they use a version of off-policy RL with some simulation pre-training, et cetera, to um, get stacking to work really robustly with multiple objects. Uh, which I think is neat. And another one I think is, is interesting is you can combine this with some amount of demonstration to get it to do really fine grain manipulation tasks. You can get it to do these like insertion type tasks with a few demonstrations because it's sometimes really hard to explore um, to get things perfect. And so they have a few demonstrations added to an off policy RL method and they get pretty good performance at doing fine grain industrial insertion problems. Right. Again, with fully real world training. Um, it'll get there eventually. Um, yeah, so seems like people have explored lots of different, you know, robotics implementations for these off policy RL algorithms. You can see that the tasks they do are still like pretty restricted. No one is cooking dinner with off policy RL, um, but it's a start at trying to do things directly in the real world. And um, yeah, so I think there's a lot more to do here, but these are some examples I thought were interesting and exciting. Okay, so just to provide a little bit of perspective before we move to model-based RL, um, what are these? What are the pros and cons of these off-policy RL methods? Right? So the pros are that it's you know sample efficient enough that you can learn in the real world. You can learn from images with yeah, some design choices. Um, and it's off policy in that you can incorporate prior data. So it allows you to incorporate demos, simulation, prior data from other sources in principle. Right? Um, but the cons are that it's often quite unstable. Like Isaac was saying, it uh, sometimes achieves lower asymptotic performance, sometimes doesn't get up to as good as PPO would. And it often requires uh, significant storage, like what was saying. Right? Um, it's good at some set of tasks, but it's not, um, you know, by any means as extensive as the task that model free RL has been used on in simulation. So um, there's a trade-off. I think if you really want a difficult task to work in sim, I would recommend using on-policy methods. If you want to do things in the real world, don't even think about on-policy methods, just try using off-policy methods. Cool. Um, 
Any questions before we move to the next thing? Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can talk about is like response to your questions yeah. uh -huh. and like to get those methods to work, like how <laughs> and to uh, like right. the reward Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we'll have a lecture on reward specification, but um, parse reward functions are huge pain, and usually the ways that I've seen to get them work, which which work well are just to add a little bit of demo data into your replay buffer where you get some positive signal. And so a lot of the large scale of policy results just take like some human collected or scripted demo data where you have like 30% success rate and add it to your buffer. And I think that helps a lot. Um, the other ways of doing it are trying to learn reward shaping or use like an exploration method. Um, those don't work as well. Okay. But I think, um, what I would do is add a little bit of data, which is kind of cheating, but it doesn't have to be perfectly successful. Just to make it successful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. All right. So, you know, we we in the first lecture we talked about solving this reinforcement learning problem. You want to maximize the sum of expected rewards, right? And we in the second lecture, we talked about how to do this gradient descent, right? This policy gradient. We went through a bunch of um, improvements to make this, you know, more stable, better, more performant. Okay. We next talked about how to solve this problem with dynamic programming by leveraging the Markovian property of your environment, so it can be off policy um, and efficient, right? And today, what we're going to talk about is how to solve the same objective with model-based optimization. Right? And so, what I mean by model-based optimization is that we're going to try and learn a model of the world. Right? So we're going to learn a model of the transition dynamics of the world. So how, when you're at some state, you take some action, it goes to some state S prime. Right? We assume in reinforcement learning that you can sample from this transition dynamics, but you don't know its form. Right? So you can't um, you know, take gradients through it. You can't, um, you know, like if you're in the real world, you don't have a simulator that you can like reset to wherever and take samples, right? So you only assume that you can um, take samples from it, but you don't know functional form. What we're going to try and do is learn an approximation to the dynamics model, and then use that to maximize this rule, right? So what we're going to try and do is we're going to learn some approximation by P theta hat, right? And then we're going to maximize the expected reward under P theta hat, not under P theta, right? So when I say model-based optimization, I mean, we're going to try and get a surrogate of the world and then plan in that surrogate. Right? And this doesn't need to just be a model of optimal behavior. It's a model of all behavior. Right? Like when I'm in the world at some state S, I take an action A, what is likely to happen? Right? OK, so the goal here is we want to learn you know, a surrogate model of the transition dynamics. So how do states transition to each other given particular actions? Um, and then you can do reward maximization against this model. right? So this is intuitive in that you're like, this is what people would call intuitive physics often, right? You're just trying to learn a model of how the world works. And once you have this model of how the world works, um, you can then plan lots of different stuff in it, right? Not just the stuff that you saw. So it's naturally off policy because you're saying that you can learn this model, not just from optimal data, but from arbitrary data, right? And then once you have the model, then you can look for optimal behavior. And so it doesn't need all of the complications of off policy like q learning methods to be off policy you're just doing you know you're just learning a model of the world and then you're planning on this so in principle it could be a lot simpler right yeah it just seems like instead of like doing a robot on how to take out something it would be instead of learning like the best way to take out the item it would be how a robot on works yes and then yes and then like do right. that to figure out the yeah you're like trying to learn the physics of the world and, you take a gradient. and then you're trying to do it. You're trying to learn things of the world and then you're planning against you. Another way of thinking about it is you're trying to construct a simulator of the world and then you're planning in your simulator. Right? Um, and you're just using data to construct your simulator. Yeah. And what assumptions are there about the real world that you would make an object to carry? I have this somewhere. It's going to drop. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get it. <laughs> good question um but yes we assume we have reset access when you're sampling but in the in the model you can reset to whatever you want right yeah um, but i'll cover the assumptions very soon okay let's 
So um, if you go read any of Josh Terenbaum's papers, um, he would argue that like everyone has an intuitive model of how the world works in their brain and that's how they're doing all of the planning. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what happens, but it works well in robotics, so we'll study. Um, right? And so, okay. So the question to ask is why do we want to do model-based RL at all? Right? Um, why should we do model-based RL? Like model based RL. Well, we don't need to sample from the environment all the time. Okay. But well, that's true in our policy RL too. Uh, but I guess we can generate more data from right. the model. Right. Um, also, we can generalize to like different reward functions and just yeah. like nice. Okay. So we want to generalize to even more states. Yeah. No problem. Other thoughts? Yeah. There's also you can get like stability guarantees. Stability guarantees. Stuff. Right. So right. Uh, maybe. Because uh, I guess if you're learning the model, especially with the neural net, but yeah, you could, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you want to, you can differentiate with the dynamics. Right, you can differentiate with the dynamics, right? You can use gradients. Uh -huh. Other other thoughts? Why should we do this? I guess one thing, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I just thought maybe the transform model is like the UP class. Yes. That, yes, that, that's that's a really good insight. In some environments, the transition model is much easier to learn than the policy <laughs> or the Q function. Um, so there's like some really nice papers from some folks at Stanford where they show you can like take a like a piecewise, like a sawtooth dynamics um, and like a simple, really simple reward. But the Q function is like this really nasty, like very, very messy function. Even you just, you know, convolve the dynamics and the reward. And so you can find cases which where the dynamics are really simple, reward is really simple, but the resulting Q functions and policies are really complicated. Um, but you could also find the opposite. <laughs> and so that's, I think that's super cool research to do on like when are policies have served the policy. Oh, yeah. 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 I think the RL is also more similar to like Right. More similar to super adherent cross, right? Simple, stable is the only thing we know that works. So, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So these these are all great. I will add them to my slides. Um, but the ones that I thought of were, you know, transfer, like Chuning was talking about. You can like use the same transition dynamics with rewards swapped out and be a lot more adaptive, be a lot more reactive. Um, efficiency, right? So here's See that little line over there? That's model-based RL method. And then the model-free RL method. Okay. But the model-free RL methods are shown here and there. But the model-based RL methods finish before the model-free RL methods even start, right? So I think this might be a little bit of a red herring. It's not that extreme. But um, in general, model-based RL methods have been more efficient than model-free ones. Um, and um, you know, as, as folks are saying, it's simple, it's supervised learning, it's stable, you can provide guarantees, um, maybe, um, and yeah, so I think there's lots of reasons to do it, yeah. So I think that the model itself is designed, like if you're still doing iterative builder, and the whole thing is designed by the Right, right, that's true, that's true, but I guess compared to like fixed point iteration, which is what you do with off policy RL, where the left and the right hand side are moving, um, the like, it, it's a lot more stable to optimize, at least the model part. And then you can do, we'll talk about different ways to do planning under the model, but you can use um, not do learning, which is a lot. You can do policy grid in the model. That might be a lot more stable. Yeah. Okay. And, and then it's naturally off policy, right? You can just like take shitty data. And I'll, I'll show you some examples where you just take random data and then you get like really interesting directed behavior out of it, right? which I think is cool. The other reason is so that you can make cool videos. Um, so these are some videos from my friend Anusha at Berkeley. Um, and she tries to get the shadow hand to, you know, rotate these these two balls in um, in the hand. So she wants to get it to like keep rotating. Right. And so that's this is different progressions of training. This is at the start. Um, and this is through training, right? And then eventually she gets a policy that pretty reliably succeeds at keeping the balls in the hand um, and training on a real shadow hand um, with just two hours of real robot training. And if any of you have used a shadow hand, 
it will break in two hours of real world training, 100%. And then it costs you $200,000 to fix. And so if you want to use hardware like this in the real world, like the, the only system that I've seen that would work is a model-based RL system. So I think that's particularly encouraging that we can get you know, high dimensional complex behavior directly in the real world um, um, with model-based RL. Yeah, um, cool. So that's why I think we should study it, right? And then there's you know, the argument that the brain does prediction and there's this paper I recommended in the first lecture the free energy principle or free energy theory, which I think is cool, but a lot of it is based on prediction error, right? So this theory says that, you know, you're trying to minimize Bayesian surprise, which means you're always trying to like change your model of the environment and change the way you act in the world. So you're as uh, minimally surprised as possible. To measure surprise, you need to have a model of the world at work. How do you know what you're surprised by, right? And so there's arguments that you know, a bunch of these papers make for like, how the brain does prediction. Um, I don't know if we should take them super literally, but there's something interesting there and probably means we should investigate. Okay, all right. So now that we've you know, convinced ourselves that model-based RL is worthwhile, right? Uh, maybe. Uh, let's try to you know, list out the problem statement. So there's two parts, right? There's model learning and then there is planning, right? So by model learning, I mean, what we want to do is we want to you know, take some data set from the real environment, from the true dynamics P, and you want to build some surrogate model P theta hat, which is under some loss function L. Um, we'll get to you know, instantiating these things in a second. But you want to like learn a surrogate of the world using, by minimizing some loss function, supervised learning. Um, and then you want to do planning, which is saying that, hey, under my approximate model P hat, I want to find policy that maximizes reward or maximizes sum of rewards, right? And so the only difference from RL is that you're doing this under P hat and not under P, right? On a, from model free RL. Right? Now, for those of you who work with, you know, Byron, for instance, this, you'll notice that this is, you don't always have to get a buy. You can also optimize for a single trajectory or single path. Um, but this is a general location. You can say pi is any controller, right? It doesn't have to be a super generalizable controller. You're just saying that you want to find a controller that can act in the world based on your um, surrogate model P hat, right? And so the whole lecture about model based RL is just how do we instantiate model learning? How do we do planning in a way that works in the real world, right? Does that make sense? Super simple, just two parts. Yeah. So you're still trying to, so, so your word function is based on the model dynamics, not the real world dynamics. Not like model based so your reward function is based on the state, but your state transitions are based on the learned model. Okay. Right. So, so the assumptions in, in most model based style is that your reward function is known and it's like a function that you know on state. It's just that how you transition between state is a learned function and you don't have a stimulator. Um, that may be an unreasonable assumption. <laughs> But um, there's also newer things that try to learn that function on state and then from the data itself and then try to plan with the learned reward and the learned transition. Yeah. Any other questions about the problem statement? No? Right. Okay, so the question is just how should we instantiate these, right? That's all we're going to go through today. Um, so what we're not going to cover is ILQR, ILQG, like things where you have linear dynamics, quadratic quad, quadratic quads, right? Um, what we're not going to cover is model-based RL, where you use something like a Gaussian process or non-parametric to learn your model. You can do that; it works really well. But we're not going to cover it, um, and we're not going to cover things like non-linear trajectory optimization and go deep in the you know, optimization landscape of how to use gradients in trajectory optimization. I think um, Byron's class super good. You guys should take it. Um, Russ Tedrick's class at MIT is also very good for these things. Um, I would recommend it. Uh, but today, what we're going to cover is how do we use neural networks as our model, right? So it's deep robotic learning. So we're going to use deep uh, deep models to model our transition dynamics. And then we're going to say, okay, how do we make those ineffective tools? <laughs> um, 
and then plan with the model so that we get the way we can do it. I can also conduct that as well. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so as I was saying, what are the assumptions? Right? Um, so the assumptions we're going to make is that we have access to the environment, but we can only sample from it. So the standard RL assumption, right? Um, you can reset the environment when you're doing model-based RL. We, we assume that we're in the standard setting where we can reset the environment um, and, and keep learning. We don't have to have that assumption. It just like works better in practice often. Um, and then the reward function is no, right? So um, we're going to assume that we know some R as a function of state, but we could also learn this. And then, um, yeah, we'll get into, into the last assumption in the reward specification. Right? Is it reset to an arbitrary distribution or just like it's reset to a stationary P0 distribution? Yeah. Um, in principle, the model based RL doesn't really have to be have resets, um, because or like most problems don't have to have resets. Maybe what policy gradient does, but a model based RL, because you're learning at transition dynamics, you could take like random data because it's learning things at the transition level. You don't have to have it, um, but it just makes everything easy. Does that make sense as assumptions? Is anyone upset by these assumptions? No? All right. Yeah. Okay. Who wants reset? <laughs> That's true. Who wants reset? Um, all right. And so the general template we're going to have for model based RL algorithms right, is that you're going to like do data collection in the world, right? Take samples in the environment. You're going to use that to learn a model, right? In theta hat. You're going to use the model for planning. Right? Planning is going to give you a controller. Controller is going to go back to more data collection. And you're going to repeat model learning, planning, data collection, model learning, planning, data collection. And we're just going to figure out how to instantiate model learning and planning. Right? Data collection is you're just going to learn your run your planner and your environment. Yeah. Are we saving the environment? Should we always go to the initial set or can we go to any other Yeah, I think that's what Ave was asking. It's uh, we typically would assume that you sample from a fixed initial distribution, but it doesn't have to be a single state. It could be a distribution of state. Okay, so all we're going to try and do is instantiate these two boxes. Okay, so the outline of our lecture today is going to be, we're going to start with V0, right, which is random shooting in MPC. It's the most naive way you can do things. Then we're going to say, okay, how can we, you know, do better with MPPI and MPC? Then we're going to say, okay, how do we make our models better? So the first V1 is how do we make our planners better? V2 is how do we make our models better? V3 is how do we get rid of planners altogether, right? And use policy optimization. And V4 is how do we make this whole thing work with images and high dimensional states and so on, right? And so we're going to, we're going to try and start from the most naive thing and go to the the, you know, the thing that was published last week and, and see if we can even do it. Okay. And please stop me anywhere. It doesn't make sense. We'll use next lecture if needed, right? So don't worry about it. Okay, cool. So let's get to it, right? So let's start with the, the V0 uh, of how do we instantiate, you know, model data. So we start with our template, right? And we say, okay, we're going to do model learning with maximum likelihood supervised learning, right? We're just going to take a bunch of data, Fit it, supervised learning, regression, max likelihood, right? And for planning, we're just going to do random search. We're just going to try random shit and pick the best one. That's it, right? And that's going to work pretty well. So let's let's try and understand what I mean by this, right? So um, the most naive algorithm uh, for model learning, right, is you just want to do maximum likelihood. You want to fit one step models, right? So you're going to take a bunch of transition tuples from your environment, SAS prime, right? And try to learn a P theta hat. So you maximize log P S prime given SA, right? And the theta here is going to be some big neural net, right? And then you can choose different families of P theta hat, and this will give you different log functions. Um, so, but but the whole problem is just basically supervised learning, right? So you have everything is IIE, the sample from your data set IIE, you use the maximum likelihood. Right? But the, the important bit here is that your choice of P, P theta hat determines what your loss function is going to be. Right? So for instance, if you choose a Gaussian, this is just an L2 loss function, regression. Right? If you choose something like an energy-based model, right? something which is 
saying that your likelihood is proportional to some exponent of energy or exponent of negative energy, right? You get an algorithm called contrastive divergence, which is a method for training EBM. Right? Um, if you use diffusion model, if you want, the, 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 the objective is score matching. Right? So you can use whatever supervised learning method you want. It's just they're going to lead to slightly different objectives. And your choice of um, probability distribution family is going to lead to different objectives. And then so most people would use a Gaussian and they use a Gaussian with a fixed covariance, which is just linear regression, no, not linear, but non-linear regression. Um, but a lot of these other methods work well, especially when your environment is multimodal, right? So it's, if it's stochastic, multimodal, you want to use more expressive families, right? So it's not just that you need to make your neural net bigger. You also need to change, change your family of P theta hat distribution so it's more expressive, right? So big neural net is not the only, the only answer here. Now, the, the trouble with it is that the more expressive your distribution, the more risk you have of overfitting. So uh, an overfitting, as we'll look at next, is going to be a big problem in model-based data. Okay. Now, a little trick. If you're implementing this, almost always try and model the residuals rather than the states. So like, don't try to predict S prime. Give an essay, try to predict the delta S prime, given L or S prime minus S. Um, it just works a lot better, it's lower variance. It's kind of the same reason that a baseline works well in policy gradients, just lower variance. Okay, does that make sense for model fitting? The standard supervised learning, nothing fancy. Yeah, okay. Now, once you have your model, right? What is it? It's a generative model. So you can feed in an S and an A and you can generate an S prime, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed in a bunch of random A's, look at what the trajectories are in the model and then pick the best one. That's it, right? So we're going to say, okay, um, we're going to take our P theta hat and we're going to stick in different action sequences, A0 to D, right? It's going to give us new fake states, S hat T, S hat T plus one, S hat T plus two, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to try and choose the one which has the maximum sum of the warps, right? Um, and that's that's going to be the easiest version of plan, is random search, right? And so, um, you know, Bigger form, it looks like you're going to take random trajectories in your model, right? You're going to do random stuff. Random stuff, maybe some of it may be optimal, some of it may not be optimal, but hopefully with enough random trajectories, you get enough coverage, you take the best one, um, you use that to collect some more data, and then you repeat, right? But the point is, you're just going to select a bunch of random actions, and then you're going to take the sequence which has the highest reward and just execute that sequence in the environment, right? Open loop. And that's going to be the, the first and simplest method. Right? Seems easy. Yeah. Is this the plan that you actually want to use your model, or is this you doing it for each training to like yeah. make it so that like it weighs on? That's a great question. Yeah. So you do this during execution, not during. So at, at training time, all you do is you learn your model, right? So we um, do the maximum likelihood thing you do at training time. And at execution time, you're put in some real state S. And then you start from your real state at not, and then you sample a bunch of future imaginary states from there at execution time, um, and then choose the best one, and then execute those actions from there. Right? Now, that makes it super slow, right? Because you have to like essentially do all of this planning at execution time, whereas for model pre RL, you just run your policy, right? Um, but we'll talk about that. Yeah. Do you do you run the entire set of actions that you find, or just the first one and read one? Right. Oh, that's the next one. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, so running open loop is going to be really bad. Um, what's your name? Josh. Josh. So Josh uh, preempted my next slide, and we're going to do um, we're going to do the planning, right? So the idea here um, is that when you you know run an open loop sequence of actions, right? So you chose the best sequence of actions in your model, you ran that. When you run an open loop sequence of actions, um, you know, if your model was wrong or you had stochasticity in your environment, et cetera, you essentially have no way to recover, right? You're going, 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 and you're just screwed. And um, if you have a model, you should be able to respond to any errors that you made by replanning, right? And so the simplest thing that you can try doing, so yeah, you might, Try to go on the green path. You have some stochasticity. You end up somewhere where you're unstable or you're you know, totally deviating from the path that you, you want to go on. Um, and, um, and then you end up over here. Right? So the simplest thing you can do is just replan. Right? So all it's saying is that, okay, we're going to sample a bunch of trajectories. 
we're going to choose our best path, right? And then we're just going to execute the first action. And the first action, okay, didn't go exactly where I thought it was going to go because of stochasticity, model error, whatever, right? But then I'm going to take, and so you do planning in the imaginary space, right? Choose the best sequence of actions, and then you execute in the real environment, right? So all of this stuff is imaginary. And then the black line is in the real world, right? So you step into a new state, and then you do a bunch of imaginary planning again. You get the next act, you plan a sequence of actions again, you take the best one, you execute it again, and you replan, you replan, you replan, right? So this is what you call, so you, you keep doing this, and hopefully because you're doing feedback, it's like a feedback controller, right? So you're planning based on what you actually did. Uh, you should do a lot better than if you just ran the things openly, right? This is what you call model predictive control or receiving horizon control. It's uh, it's just saying that do replan. That's it, <laughs> right? Um, and so, yeah, this is almost always just, if you're doing model-based RL, do replanning. Um, when you're doing model-free RL or policy grain, your, your policy is already a feedback controller, right? Because your policy is conditioned on your state. And so it's already doing feedback. Whereas if you just plan an open loop sequence of actions, it's no longer a feedback control, right? So yeah, the, the first and sim the simplest idea in model-based RL is just do replan. And right? so you plan with, you know, random search starting from your state, Take, you get a bunch of sequence of actions that is then execute the first one, see where you reached, or you, you don't have to execute just the first one, you can execute the first key, see where you reached, and then do replan, and you just repeat. Okay, so let's put these pieces together, right, and then we'll, we'll pause for questions, which is saying, collect a bunch of data, maybe you start with random data, you learn your model with supervised learning, regression, max likelihood, whatever, right, then you do planning, um, with replanning using MPC, using model predictive control, right? And with random random search, um, gonna look something like this. Then you go back, do more data collection, improve your model, repeat, right? Uh, and so, yeah, very simple. You can implement this in like 30 lines of code. Um, cool. I will, yeah. And, and the, the only thing I really want you to take from here is that MPC is good because it lets you do replanning and that gives you a feedback controller, which is better than you know, purely open loop search. And given the model, you can generate a shit ton of random samples as opposed to real data or you know, even um, a really expensive simulator. If you just have a neural net model, you can just wildly parallelize it and generate, generate a shit ton of data. So even random search works reasonably well, right? Because you're just random searching with a lot of data. Okay, I will pause here for questions before we go to some videos. Any thoughts, questions, concerns? Yeah. Is there any difference though in model based for all with policy RL? Yes, <laughs> that's my last slide. <laughs> but, but basically, I think model based RL is very similar to Q learning, but it's very different than policy grading. And um, because you can think of model-based RL as like modeling the future, right? So it's like modeling what happens in the future um, in terms of states. And Q-learning is modeling what happens in the future in terms of rewards, right? But both of them are modeling the future um, and they're modeling, you know, outcomes in the future and then saying, let's pick the best outcome, right? And um, one of them is there's like subtle differences. Some of them are modeling rewards, some of them are modeling states, some of them are modeling cumulative things. Other ones are modeling one step thing. And so there's differences like that. But I think policy gradient is really different because it just does not model the future. It says, let's model what action to take in the present, given that we're going to be optimal in the future. But I never model what's going to happen in the future. And so you can never be off policy with policy gradient unless you do stuff. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I think I forget to it for one day, but uh... Uh, that the black person provides an control between model. Yes. So if the model is not changing, they are like they're starting a corner situation, and then actually your next sample is the open sample that's going to be so yeah. Right. So this doesn't really deal with exploration, like you're saying, right? Like you really want your model to get better. And so what this is relying on is that the the planner, which has some noise in it, will give you more samples, which will get better, but it's very possible that you don't collect data and you don't get better. So um, if you remember my first few slides, there's all these methods on exploration. Like the same thing applies here. You can do planning with exploration, which will give you like better data. Yeah. 
So we can find those exploration that we just can instead of art max staff objectives and just pack on stuff about yeah. 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 Well, it's a little more involved than that, but because you're like planning under your model. And so things that um like thing your model might be wrong, right? And so things that are optimistic under your model might not be optimistic in real world. And so you have to account for the uncertainty of the model. Oh, okay. Where, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and yeah, we'll cover uncertainty based models then, and it becomes a little more clear. Yes. How do you relate to human? Like, yeah. If you don't have access to human, like a model that you can like overcome faster than like running the whole thing with the It's a great question. Um it is a fully data-driven simulator, right? And so without the priors. And so it's likely to generalize a lot worse, but it, you can take gradients through it. Um you can, you know, sample probably quicker, but because it doesn't have physics baked in, it can be completely inconsistent. Um and so I would say if you had a simulator, um it's great, but here you can construct it from real data, whereas in a simulator you have to do like the system ID, et cetera. It's non-differentiable, it's difficult. Whereas in like a fully differentiable simulator, you can construct from data. Right? I think a really promising method is these residual models. Like um, if you went to Shuran's talk, she was talking about these residual models, which say start from a simulator and then learn the gaps, right? Because sometimes the simulator, because it's in the like physics space and the whatever choice of parameterization they have. Um, it may just never have enough expressivity to capture your behavior. Whereas if you had a residual, it could do a lot better. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a good reference for these residual models? Sorry. Like, do you have a good reference for these residual models? Um, yes. I I think the a good one is from Maria Bauza and Anurag and Alberto at MIT on. I think that residual models for planar pushing, um, which was like best paper to IROS or ICRA or something a couple of years ago. Um, that's a good one, I think. It gives you a good survey. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it out also. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yes. Um, if, if you're like environments dynamic, yes. is there any way that right right because you're doing replanning right um i guess one thing is if you're you're um learning a model of the world which is stochastic right it's not just a deterministic model you can model stochasticity in the environment um and because you're doing replanning let's say like something randomly changed you know the position of this thing you can account for it by doing on the fly replanning which might be a lot harder for a policy um so i would say that your model-based style is already a lot more reactive than your policy is. Um, in principle, your policy could do it too because it's a feedback controller, but it's like harder to like. Okay, so does it work? This seems like the, the most naive thing in the world, right? It shouldn't work. Here, the swimmer performs a left turn, does receiving work. only sp Um, And so this is when this first came out in like 20 whatever, like we weren't able to solve Mujoko, you know, we were in a dark, dark time and uh, Anusha lit the way for us, it was great, but she can get this <laughs> struggling swimmer to follow paths with um, only trained on random data. So it's like not even trained on, you know, very interesting lots of data. It's trained on a very small amount of random data and it's able to do path following in a way that at that point model 3RL wasn't able to do, um, which, I, which I thought was pretty inspiring. Um, and then you can apply it to, it's a little hard to see, but there's like a little cockroach, which is trying to follow these paths on this, um, on this carpet, right? So she's laid out a bunch of waypoints that needs to follow. She just runs the roach randomly in the, in the real world environment, learns the neural network dynamics model from scratch and just does random shooting plus MPC. That's it. Um, and it does super well. Um, it's not going to work for all problems. And that's why the rest of the lecture, but um, the fact that it even worked was super surprising. Um, and I think it like changed the way we think about model based data. Because before this, no one ever used model based data. Um, so yeah, this, this is 20 minutes of real world training time. Um, back in 2017 or whatever, she came up with it. Uh, we were taking like five days to train every RL agent. And so this was amazing.
And then if you look at, does it actually work, right? In terms of metrics, um, this, uh, this line right there is model-based RL. So you can see that it shoots up way quicker, right? But it like kind of doesn't go up after that, right? So the red, red line is if you fine tune it model-free RL, um, but if you just did model-based style, it just kind of plateau over here, whereas model free RL continues to get a lot better, but takes way, way, way more data, right? And so there's still a significant gap from model free RL if you just do this. And that's why um, that's why we had to develop all of the other stuff. But in terms of learning speed, it's like at least several orders of magnitude faster. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, V0. Yeah. Okay, so that's V0. V0 is just uh, learning a model with maximum likelihood and then doing random shooting plus, plus replan. That's it. Okay. Any questions about V0 before we move to V1? Okay. So V1 is uh, saying, okay, well, the part of this V0 that seemed the most dubious was this random shooting stuff, right? It's like doing random search in your model by sampling actions randomly. Like searching for a needle in a haystack, right? You're just like hoping. Um, you know, Shmidl was asking about sparse reward. If you have sparse reward, like you're just hoping that you will chance upon the sparse reward, um, and that can be pretty difficult. Or if um, you know the search problem becomes very hard, high variance. Uh, so there's probably something better we can do for search, right? So the idea we're going to use here is that you know when we're doing search. Um, normally what we're doing with random shooting is we're sampling these action sequences from some uniform distribution or a Gaussian distribution, and then we're choosing the best one, right? But you're like keeping the distribution fixed. You're just saying, I'm going to sample all these actions from some fixed distribution every time, and we're just going to choose from there. Okay. But what we should be able to do is we should be able to inform the sampling distribution of our actions when you're doing random search, uh, not just to be this stationary uniform distribution, but a distribution that is um, informed by the rewards, right? So intuitively what you mean is, what, what I mean is uh, if you want to do better, sample more around things that have high reward, right? So rather than saying, I'm gonna always sample uniformly everywhere, I should say, okay, I sample uniformly first, and then I realize, okay, these things are better. So I'll sample more around there. Then I realize some other things are better. So I sample more around there. You wanna iteratively refine your distribution based on the reward, right? Which seems like, what you should do. Okay. And so the idea we're going to use here is all we want to do is we want to iteratively um, upweight the actions um, that are going to be you know, higher return or higher sum of rewards than the others, and then update our sampling distribution rather than sampling randomly during random search. Right? Uh, or we're still sampling, but we're not sampling from the same random distribution. Right? So that's, that's just going to be, that's the main idea behind V1. Right? It's just saying that we start by doing random sampling, but the next time we do sampling, we want to do it around a much narrower distribution, which is you know, weighted by the sum of rewards that the first round did. Right? And if you notice, this is very similar to cross entropy method um, or like any of these like gradient free black box methods. It's just saying sample a bunch of times, weight by reward, um, and then you get a new distribution, which is a reward weighted distribution. Sample again, get reward again, repeat, right? So all this is going to do is going to say, let's sample n sequences from your action distribution, right? We're going to um, sample act, like state trajectories from your model using these action sequences, right? So currently we're sampling from some distribution PA. Let's start that from the uniform or from the random Gaussian, right? You're just sampling shit then. Then you're gonna run it through your model, get a bunch of future states, right? And once you have future states, you're gonna try and compute the rewards. That should be S hat, but um, you're gonna try and compute the rewards under your future states, right? And then upweight things proportional to the exponentiated sum of rewards, right? So you're gonna say that, okay, those action sequences that had um, high sum of rewards, they're gonna upweight. Those that had low sum of rewards, they're gonna downweight, right? And for those of you who are you know, more familiar with RL, it looks a lot like reward weighted regression, right? You're just saying do regression weighted by the exponential reward, right? Um, and then you just update your P of A to this reward weighted update, right? Or return weighted update, and then you repeat, right? And so 
Now all you've said is, okay, I've, I've done that one time, I get a better distribution, I collect some more data, recompute the reward, update and repeat. And you can derive this from first principles um, by like trying to say that the sampling distribution should have low KL divergence with the optimal sampling distribution. And then you have to use this like um, control is inference framework to make it easy, or you can use the path integral framework. But if for those of you who are interested, um, Byron has a series of really nice papers on, on MPPF. Um, but this is just the key idea. Sample, upweight, free sample, upweight, free sample, upweight, right? But the point is you're no longer searching for a needle in a haystack by doing random stuff. You're like using your past experience to search a little smarter, right? So this is MPPI, it's gonna lower your variance um, and it's gonna you know, work a lot better in practice, right? And so all of the later results after this Anusha is first to be zero, use a version of MPPI or cross entropy method or something. Okay, so if we go back to our template, we collected some data. We're gonna learn our model the same way with maximum likelihood. We're gonna then plan with this MPPI with replanning, right? So the important thing is all of this process that right, is all within one time step. So I'm planning at some state S. I'm gonna run this process like 10 times at that S and then I'm gonna execute one action and then I'm gonna do it again, right? So it can be pretty expensive, but um, you still wanna do MPC, you still wanna do replanning, but you wanna do it with a smarter sample. Right, so we're gonna do MPPI plus MPC, model predictive control, right? Um, and then we're gonna go back and do data collection, model learning, and repeat. And it's just gonna be better than random shooting because your, your planning is just way lower variance, right? And if we learned anything from lecture two and three, we just want a lower variance. That's just our goal in life, um, right? So what we're gonna try to do is just um, get a method that lower variance. You can do, we'll cover other methods that do this, but this is the simplest one, right? And you notice here that we don't actually want to learn a policy or anything like that. You just want to get a sequence of actions and execute the first one. So it doesn't have to work in every state. And as opposed to a policy, which you want to generalize and work in every state, blah, blah, blah. With model-based RL, in at least this version, you don't care about generalizing to every state. You just want it to work at this state, right? And then you'll replan, and then you'll replan, and you'll replan. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Um, and so this is some cool videos from Byron, um, but they had this, this project at Georgia Tech where they were trying to get um, this car to, to drive in a you know, rally arena, like drift and do super high speed um, navigation, right? And they um, learned a neural network controller from some human collected data, right? And then they uh, had a cost map, which encouraged it to you know, not hit the sides and drive really fast. And you just do MPPI and it, it works super well. And there's better and better variants of this, um, but, but yeah, I thought these results are pretty cool. Okay, that's V1. Um, let's maybe take uh, two minutes. We'll, we'll get to V2 after that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, were we talking about uh, properties? Yeah. Do they use another distribution and then yeah, that's a good question. So the way the way that they do it often in practice is that they um they like assume fixed covariance. So they like just take the mean and then they take the mean to be the weighted um average of samples. Oh. <laughs> and then they have a fixed covariance. You can also fit the covariance. Um, but yeah, the way the way they often do it is they say like the new mean is the the actions times the exponential returns, um, and then they just add some covariance. Because at the end of the, yeah, and 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 then what you eventually want to do, uh, like um, when you're not exploring, is just run the means. Yeah, nice. So it works like surprisingly well. I think <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for a naive, uh, naive-ish method, right? It sounds kind of naive, but it works really well. Yeah, especially thinking that it's cross and yeah. student model. Yeah. That seems like it's gonna be cross. I think that the key is that you're, it's not a global thing. It's like, because you're replanning, it's local. Uh, uh, and you just need to be good there. <laughs> and you don't need to be, it's not like imitation learning where you have to capture all the modes. You just need to get one. So you just need to get one. 
I guess there's like you like massively parallelize the time. Yeah, it's like 10,000 points. And use the GPU. Do you guys do it on board? Oh, shit. It's very fun. Parallel. Yeah. <laughs> and have you tried running a policy? Like, rather than, uh, like, use the MPPI to supervise a policy or something, or is that just too crazy? Because you, yeah, well, uh, you can't clip it or anything. No, I think we definitely could do it. I just don't think that's like, it's what they care about doing right now. Do you think it'll work better? Depends on how it would be trained. Hmm. Yeah. I guess, could you use I think the. We don't have good simulators, so it'd be yeah. Yeah. Fair. But let's say we did MPPI a bunch, and then you just use that to keep training a policy. And like, that might not be that bad. Yeah. We also have demonstrations. That's one of the nice things about the right. Really good demonstrations. Right, right, right. All righty. So we've <laughs> we've only covered V1, V1, but let's get to V2, right? Um, so um so we've we've done we're still doing maximum likelihood um you know models and then doing essentially shooting but we're doing shooting with a slightly smarter sampling distribution right? but um what often happens is with these learned models especially with these large neural network models um the rollouts under your learned model are very different than the rollouts under your true model right so you like have really low loss everything is awesome right um, but you like run it and your true rollout looks like this and your like sample rollout looks like that. Your law and it's you started at exactly the same state. You roll out the action, but you just like take an action, take the new state, feed it back into the model, take it. So you do it auto regressive, right? Um, and you see this huge deviation, right? Um, um, so what is it? 10 steps tuning? Is that how much it lasts before it deviates? I'm not sure. It's pretty quick. Right. Yeah, at least I've seen it deviate super quickly. And even if no matter how much you reduce the training loss, it deviates. Huge model deviates, right? Um, and often this happens because of lack of data. It's not the only reason, right? But um, the issue is that you are sticking things back into your model, right? And even if you're, you're, so you're generating a new state, you're sticking it back into your model. And if your new state is even a little bit wrong, right? With a huge model, it looks like it's OD. Right, and so now you have something that's OD, um, and then your model can do whatever the hell it wants. Right, so like small errors in the state that you generate become OD inputs to your model. You have something that's OD as an input, but oh, I mean out of distribution. Right, if it's out of distribution as input to your model, then your model, especially with a deep model, you essentially have no guarantees. It can generate something crazy. You make bigger error, bigger error, bigger error. So you have like a compounding error issue. And here we'll cover the same thing. Same thing happens in imitation learning, but in model-based RL, it definitely happens because of this auto-regressive generation, right? You're generating, feeding back in, generating, feeding back in, and this gets worse as your state space gets bigger, right? Because more things are OOD, right? Um, the other thing that can happen is if you feed in actions that you haven't seen before, right? Let's say your training data has some set of actions, but when you're planning, you're generating things from MPPI or random sampling. Maybe you've never seen that part of the action space. Um, then it's also OD to your model. Right? So if it's OD to your model, you produce something crazy, 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 and then you just end up completely, um, some, something that completely deviates from reality, right? So you're hallucinating nonsense. Um, and, and the problem with hallucinating nonsense is that when you plan under nonsense, you get nonsense. And so um, you will think that paths that are good, you will think that paths that are good might be pretty bad, Paths that are bad might be pretty good. And so your policy um, can be like very, very far. If, you know, J pi in the true world might be very different than J pi under your model, right? That's what the issue is. Right? And so really this just comes from this model being bad on all of these states. Um, and so that's why most of these, these models can only, you know, roll out for five or 10 steps. So in the previous two versions, um, we did MPC with like a horizon of 10. And then after that, it starts deviating. And that's what makes this really bad. Okay. So does that make sense? Compounding error, right? 
Okay, how do we how do we deal with compounding error? Right? Like the first the first thing is why don't we just change the training objective of the model so that it just doesn't compound, right? So normally what we do is we minim we you know maximize likelihood we minimize this thing called equation error, right? Which is your one step prediction error. You're trying to maximize likelihood in one step. The problem is it has nothing, no knowledge of what happens when you generate from your model and feed it back in, right? So it's not a case step loss. It's a one step loss. So what you could do is you could say, okay, let's uh, let's train with a case step loss rather than a one step loss, right? And that's something you're gonna call simulation error. And all that simulation error is saying is that rather than taking the loss of just you know one step with real transitions, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and generate you know one step transitions under a model, two step transitions under a model, three step transitions under a model, and try and make sure all of them are close to reality, right? So you have like trajectories, and then you generate multi-step rollouts from your model, and then you try to make all of them close, right? But the important thing is that you are generating and feeding back in, generating, feeding back in, generating, feeding back in, and then making sure that the loss at one, two, three, four k steps are all is all small, or the sum of losses, right? And you know, if we go back to our compounding error issue, the issue is that you know when you have a rollout under your learned model, it's very different than you roll out under your true model. What you're doing with simulation errors is you're just taking the rollout under the learned model and forcing it to be similar to the rollout under the true model, right? So you're like optimizing what you what you care about in a way. The trouble with this is that you can never optimize. And so it's like super non-convex, super hairy as an objective. It'll sometimes improve, but um, it doesn't solve the error because you just, the optimization landscape is really nasty. And it's like, um, yeah, it just becomes a horrible non-convex optimization. It doesn't work that well, but if you're ever doing model-based style, it never hurts to do this. It just uh, um, it just doesn't solve all your problems, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So yeah, instead of training a one-step model, you're just training k-step model. Okay. So what's another idea, right? What's another idea we can do to deal with compounding error? Well, you we can say, okay, let's try and estimate when we're out of distribution and deal with it, right? So when we're doing planning, right, where our planning might go out of distribution, we just need to estimate when that's happening. And if we can estimate when that's happening and account for it, then maybe we won't, you know, hallucinate nonsense. Or you can't stop the hallucination of nonsense, but you know not to trust when it's nonsense, right? Um, so that's that's the that's the idea here. All we want to do is we want to measure uncertainty, right? Which is a measure of, you know, how out of distribution you are. And if you can reason with uncertainty in your planning, then you you know can avoid a lot of these exploitation issues, right? Um, so what we've been doing so far is we've been training models with maximum likelihood, right? The maximum likelihood is point estimate, like one estimate of theta. If there's not a distribution of a theta, there's one theta, right? Um, you run your theta, your theta might be wrong, but it's super confident. Right? It's wrong and confident. And so it's like here it thinks of, you know, thinks this is it, and you have no measure of you know how good or bad things are. But if you had an uncertainty aware model, right, rather than just saying, okay, this is the theta and we're good, it has some measure of confidence, right? That's these by denoted by these little circle things, right? Has some measure of uncertainty. Okay, like I predicted something, but it's like with some uncertainty. And if I can account for uncertainty in the planning, then I can just kind of like discard this path because it's way too uncertain, right? And I can go with paths that are way more certain or do other things, right? Um, but, you know, being aware of this kind of uncertainty allows us to account for these effects of model bias, right? Or model compounding error. Um, so you can't stop the compounding error, but you can at least account for it so you don't, you're not over-optimistic in the wrong places. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So how would the um, uncertainty vary? Like you said before that typically like between five and 10 steps, your model is gonna be really good. But in general, like all of your trajectories after that are just gonna kind of vary from uh, the reality. So if you have like, this uncertainty that you're calculating further out in your trajectory, mm -hmm. is it gonna be similar for all of the trajectories? Or like, are there cases where like, okay, this yeah, is yeah, clearly, yeah. you know, much more certain about what it is? Yeah, that's a good question. Um. So I guess one thing that it definitely allows you to avoid is when you're like going completely in parts of the space that you don't know about, right? So like, let's say the data, um, so I, have, I just have this figure that will help me talk about it. Okay. 
where yeah so let's say your data was here right um and like you generated some paths in the data distribution um then you like likely won't deviate that much because you've seen all that data whereas if you like generate paths that are like out of the data distribution then the like uncertainty is a lot higher mm -hmm. now you're totally right that even within the data distribution, the uncertainty blows up like that is not fully accurate. So like circles should blow up as you go further. Mm -hmm. And so you still can't do huge horizon planning, but it's at least better than um, not accounting for it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions? Okay. So... What is uncertainty, right? So there's two types of uncertainty we're gonna think about, right? One is aleatoric uncertainty, which is uncertainty that is inherent to your environment, right? Like stuff is just moving around, right? You take a transition, like something will change. Sometimes this way, sometimes that way, right? Friction is uncertain. When you push something, it will go this way, it will go that way, right? So there's uncertainty in your environment, um, which is aleatoric uncertainty. And then there's uncertainty because of um, lack of data, right? So I just don't have enough data. And so my predictions are uncertain because um, I might just like not know exactly what to do there, right? And so that's what you call epistemic uncertainty, right? And so I think this figure illustrates it kind of nicely. Your trading data is these green X's, right? And you can see that they're not like a point estimate, right? They're like, there is variance in the X's even um, at a particular point. And so the variance here gives you your aleatoric uncertainty, that there's inherent uncertainty in the data. But in some places, you just don't have data, right? You don't have data. And when you don't have data, then your model is uncertain because you don't know what's happening there. And that's epistemic uncertainty, right? And so aleatoric uncertainty is usually a little easier to deal with because you can just make your model stochastic, like Abhay was saying earlier. But um, epistemic uncertainty is a lot harder to deal with because you have to like reason about uncertainty in your parameters because of lack of data, right? And it um, you usually have to take a Bayesian treatment of it, which is just the case. Right. And or you know, we'll we'll talk about a method that's a little more scalable, right? But the issue is that it's uh let's not worry about aleatoric uncertainty for now. Let's mostly focus on epistemic uncertainty, right? Like trying to deal with uncertainty because of lack of data. Right. So let's see, even if you're doing model-based RL in deterministic environments, it still won't work. And that's because of the epistemic uncertainty. Right. Okay. So what is uncertainty? It's the distribution of your parameters theta given your data d, right? So you want to say, I want to estimate the posterior distribution d theta given d, right? So it's saying that, okay, like normally in maximum likelihood, you try to say maximize d d given theta, right? Trying to maximize the likelihood of the data being produced under your model. And in, when you're doing uncertainty measurement, you want to get d theta given d, right? So what is the distribution of our parameters that are consistent with the data? Right. And so what it should say is that, okay, the parameters suggest that there's going to be uncertainty here and there's not going to be uncertainty here. It's just going to model epistemic uncertainty. If you can, if you can estimate this thing, right? But the problem is that it's difficult to estimate, right? Because, and the reason it's difficult to estimate is because you have, if you like use Bayes rule, right? This is just Bayes rule. So you can write as d, d given theta times d theta divided by this integral, right? And this integral is just, just it's hard to compute because you're integrating over all possible parameters, right? And so it's like a really hard, um, like a lot of, you know, Bayesian work tries to deal with trying to avoid computing this, this, this integral, which is your, what do you call your partition function, right? And so it's really difficult to estimate this posterior. And so it's difficult to measure uncertainty, right? That's the, that's the basic issue, right? So what people do is they like have a class of methods like Bayesian networks, um, you know, ensemble methods, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about them really briefly. Um, but uh, what they try and do is they try to like model the posterior distribution with different types of approximation, okay? Um, what Bayesian method, Bayesian neural networks do is they try to do it with a method called variational inference, right? So they try to say, let's avoid computing the integral by approximating the uncertainty with some function q. And like trying to make Q as similar to the um, posterior as possible. And then it does a little bit of gymnastics with the KL divergence and makes it all track, right? Um, we won't cover that today. Um, I'll send you some readings on it. Um, 
but they don't really work. Um, because, uh, and the reason is because it's like hard to solve this optimization when you have really, you know, difficult, when you have really expressive um, P theta given Bs, right? So we're not going to cover it, but it's an interesting class method. What we're going to cover is a class of methods called ensemble methods, right? And so what an ensemble method is trying to do is trying to estimate this P theta given D with an ensemble of models, right? So it's like trying to say rather than explicitly estimating uncertainty, we're just going to train K different models, right? And we're going to say, okay, let's look at the difference between the model's predictions. That's going to give us a measure of uncertainty, right? Um, and it's going to be, you can show that it's an approximate posterior, right? Especially if you train your models on different subsets of the data. Right, so the, the key behind an ensemble method for us is going to be training K models independently is going to be an approximate posterior for P theta given D. And then we're going to use that for plan. Right? So going back to model-based RL, all we're going to do is we're going to try and learn an ensemble of methods and we're going to get uncertainty from that and integrate it into plan. That's it. Right? So the, the intuition here is that if you have K different models right, on places where you have a lot of data, if you train the models independently, they will all agree where you have data, right? Because they're all they're all being trained on the same data set. So they agree where you have data, and when you don't have data, they have huge variance, right? Because nothing is supervising them. They're completely determined by okay, which subset of data they got, what initialization you had, optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So in low data regimes, you'll have high ensemble variance, and high data regimes, you'll have low ensemble variance, right? And so you can think of uncertainty being measured by the variance in the ensemble. Right? That's it. Okay, and it's way easier, works way better um, than, than Bayesian neural networks, right? And so the way we're gonna use it for model-based RL is we're gonna say, okay, let's do maximum likelihood learning as we were doing before, right? But we're just gonna learn K different models, right? And ideally what we'd wanna do is like sample different Gs for each of these learning problems by sampling with replacement from the same data set. Um, that's what would be correct. But what you often do is you just like use the same data set, you just initialize everything differently and it works pretty well. Right? But all we're doing is we've learned K different models, um, same objective, nothing else fancy. There's still, you know, Gaussian regression. Do you consider initializing specifically given that like this one is positive weights or yeah. it's just random? Weights? Just random, random weights, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Random weights, just use your PyTorch in it, yeah. Um, okay, so, all we do is we train a bunch of different models and we're going to look at the difference between the models to measure uncertainty. Right? Okay, so how do we integrate it into planning? Right? Well, the first thing we can do is we can take expected value under the uncertain dynamics. Right? So under rather than saying you're going to take expected value under your current one model, you can say take expected value under your like ensemble of models. Right? So let's say you had your data here right? and you have your low uncertainty stuff and you have your high uncertainty stuff, right? The point here is that the high uncertainty stuff, like your ensemble, one ensemble will capture that, one ensemble will capture this, one ensemble will capture this, right? And if you take the expected value over all of them, like some of them will be high, some of them will be low, um, but overall it's not gonna be overly optimistic because it's gonna be like weighted down by the ensemble elements that are low, right? So all you're gonna do is you're gonna say, we're gonna do planning just as usual, right? We're just going to do it in expectation over the, uh, these ensemble of dynamics models, right? So if you notice here, when you're sampling the next state, right? Sample it not just from, uh, like sample it from an ensemble member theta i, and then you want to average it over all the i's, right? So you want to take the expected value over the ensemble members. So rather than just saying, okay, I'm going to like take something with high uncertainty, high certainty, which might be wrong, I'm going to average over the ensemble members. So I'm going to account for uncertainty, right? And so all you're going to say is take expected value over the ensemble. There's other tricks you can do, but the reason it, it helps is because the expected reward is going to be lower than the like overconfident but wrong rewards, right? Um, and that's going to do better. Now, a somewhat smarter thing you can do is be pessimistic explicitly, right? You can say, okay, there's things that have low uncertainty. And then things that have high uncertainty, you just penalize them, right? So you're saying, okay, like when you're doing planning, what you're going to say is you're going to try and sample under your dynamics, but things where the variance is high, for states where the variance is high, which means they're very uncertain, just like avoid those states, right? Because you don't know what to do there, right? So you're just going to penalize ensemble variance. 
right? Yeah. So I can see how this would work in like you know actual deployments, but doesn't this just penalize exploration? Yes. Also? Yes. So often what you do is that you'd like do this and then like add explicit exploration with like epsilon greedy or something on top of it. And and the best like so that's why often in practice. When you're doing online RL, you do a method like this, which takes expected value, which retains some optim like some exploration. When you're doing offline, when you're training some offline data and doing offline model-based RL, you do the pessimistic thing because you're not trying to explore. Um, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, right. And so um, yeah, you're explicitly penalizing states, right? Okay, so what did we talk about here? We said we're gonna estimate uncertainty with an ensemble of models. Right. And then we, when we're going to plan, we can either take an expected value under the ensemble, or we can explicitly penalize ensemble variance. And that's going to allow you to incorporate uncertainty into your planning process. Right? Um, and does this work? Well, all the results we saw at the start were basically with the ensemble method. Right? So they're basically doing model-based RL with MPPI using the ensemble of dynamics models. Right? And that's what makes it work super well. Um, you can also get us to work on a bunch of other interesting tasks in this right? Um, but but yeah, if you want to use model-based RL with random shooting, um, you should have an ensemble of models. You should incorporate the uncertainty, and you should do MPPI, and it'll work a lot better. Right. Um, okay, so that's V two. So just to recap before we wrap up, we started by learning a dynam dynamics model, doing shooting. Then we said, okay, let's make the sampling distribution better. Let's do MPPI. Then we said, okay, let's make the models better. Let's measure uncertainty. And that's V2. And we'll cover V3 and V4 next.